No one or no thing has been more successful in persuading people to surrender like the God we serve. Only God can convince that which is of the physical to surrender to that which is of the spiritual. In the text, we see how a creature surrendered to the ideals of his creator. In the text, Isaiah is filled with emotional disappointment. He's, he's filled with gloom because his friend, his relative who once walked these dusty shores as king of Israel has had to drop the scepter of power at the gates of death and go on to a higher king, the Lord of Lords. But I tell you, although Isaiah felt such seclusion, although he felt such heartbreak, he was unaware that God had plans to take him out of his incubator of sorrow and place him down into the depths of prophetic potential. But first, Isaiah had to surrender to God's idea. The thing that I noticed was the usage of unusual attractions. You know, God does have a way of using unusual things to attract his child. The Bible proves it so. The Bible shows how the unusual has attracted man and, and caused him to reach up toward higher heights in spirituality. Think about it. Moses in the book of Exodus is on the backside of the Midian desert tending to sheep and all of a sudden he sees a pillar of smoke in the distance and yet the bush where the fire sits upon is not being consumed and that attracted him to go a little further. And you know the rest of the story. You have Paul in the New Testament who was on his way to try to destroy the living church of God And all of a sudden, bright brilliance shone around Paul. Put blinding scales over his eyes, knocked him down from his beast, rolled him over in the dirt, and that caught his attention. I have proof because he laid down as Saul, but he got up as Paul. And all of us in here, have been attracted by unusual events that have occurred in our lives and it caused our conscience to be pulled to a higher realm and we had to say that there must be a God somewhere. You remember the time when the unusual overcame you and you just knew that you were facing sure defeat? You remember the time when you witnessed the impossible occur in your life and the unusual, the unusual happened and the impossible changed into possibilities? That was just God trying to show you that I'm somewhere around. God chooses how, he chooses where, he chooses when to attract someone's attention. And most of the time is when we least expect it. Isaiah never thought that this day in the text that he would see the Lord. Isaiah, who is a prophet, son of a he is walking through the outer courts of the temple, head hanging low, 
burdens on his back. And it is there when God shows up. Isaiah was attracted because instead of seeing the high priest prostrated before the Ark of the Covenant, he saw the Lord of hosts himself sitting on a throne high and lifted up. Which actually symbolizes God's dominion and sovereignty. Oh yeah. Isaiah was attracted because instead of seeing uh, the bell trim robes of the high priest, he saw God's train or God's hem of his robe fill the temple. Did a little bit of research on that and, and, and tried to get the opinions of some of my college theologians or whatnot. And, and, and many of them uh, proclaimed that his robe or his hem of his robe actually denotes to his victorious campaigns. Now, look it up. In ancient times, a king, when he would send his men into battle, and after conquering the battle, after winning it and conquering the king that was against him, he would walk in the battleground and claim the spoils for his men. But the most signified uh, element that happens is when he ordered for the captured king's robe to be cut. And then a piece of that robe was then stitched on to the hem of his garment. So, so that means, that means his greatest recognition that spoke of his victories was contingent upon the battles that he fought. And not only the battles that he fought, but the victories he had won. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take you somewhere. So, so, so the length of his robe, therefore, was an indication of his greatness. And the longer his robe was, the more victorious he was in the eyes of his servants. <laughs> I thought about it last night. What if God's robe or the length of his hem was contingent upon just one of our lives? That length would still reach from a courthouse to a recovery bed in a hospital. It will still reach and stretch all the way down 288, down to Esther, and fill this, this place up from top to bottom, front to back. Because everybody in here ought to be able to say, God has fought many battles for me, and he has never lost one yet. Isaiah's attention was attracted to the unusual simply because instead of seeing a cupbearer at the side of the king, you know, the kings of Israel, they kept cupbearers, you know, sample the drink and make sure no one poisoned it. But, but God himself had two six-winged cherub, I mean, seraphims. Or what the Bible would call in Hebrew, uh, burning ones. They covered their faces, displaying their reverence to God. They covered their feet, displaying their humility towards God. And then they flew displaying their swift and devout service unto God. But then Isaiah hears the unusual because he, hear, he hears these two uh, seraphims conversing one to another, testifying about God's holiness. Yeah. Burning one testified about God's holiness. Burning ones testified about God's holiness. God himself is a consuming fire 
and his attendants were fire as well and even they too saw a difference between themselves and God. Let me show you something. Instead of Isaiah hearing the royal courts announce the entrance of the king of Israel, God himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he announced his own entrance. Now, that humbled me because that showed me that God doesn't have to use me. God does not have to use any of us. This is evidence that he can use himself and get whatever he wants done complete. He saw the unusual. And then he saw something else that was unusual, Reverend Washington. He saw the mobilization of a wooden post. Isaiah said, the doorpost moved at the voice of him that cried. The him was God. And lifeless cut wood moved because God said something. And some of y'all haven't moved yet. No matter how good God has been to you, no matter how far he has brought you, you are still sitting there like you all that with a bag of chips of horn. Now here's the thing. Instead of priests burning frankincense, instead of priests burning myrrh, burnt offerings, God's glory filled the house. And after being attracted to all of those things, Isaiah came to the biggest realization of all. God is near. Not only is there this unusual attraction, but there's also an undeniable admission. An undeniable admission. Whenever a finite man has a confrontation with an infinite God, man will soon recognize his own imperfections. My grandfather used to sing the song, tell me how did you feel when you come out of the wilderness? That's, that's a Mississippi song, y'all might not know anything of that. Isaiah who is from the tribe of Judah. Isaiah, who actually holds the, uh, uh, the job title prophet. Isaiah, who is a relative of the former king. He took a glimpse of what the seraphims dared to look at. And he had to confess to himself. Catch that. He had to confess to himself that he was undone. Isaiah, he realized that his righteousness did not match up with God's righteousness. Remember, Aaron had two sons and God consumed them with fire because their form of righteousness did not match up to God's righteousness. Remember Uzzah, God breached out on Uzzah, killed him dead because he died to touch the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling. And God kills him dead simply because his righteousness didn't match his righteousness. So out of fear for his life, Isaiah 
undeniably admitted to his shortcomings of righteousness and his downfalls. Oh yeah, he, he, he admits to his own spiritual limitations. See, Isaiah knew about the omniscience of God. And since there was nothing that God could not know, Isaiah admitted all of his faults to himself. In other words, he did what Pastor Anderson says. Uh, he told himself the truth. Yeah. Isaiah, he already knew. And therefore, in verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. He said, because I am a man of unclean lips and I hang out with people who also possess unclean lips. Now, 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 before you Twitch in your seat too hard. Isaiah told himself the truth. Seeing God caused Isaiah to see his own unclean lips. Seeing God caused Isaiah to remember the crowd of friends that possessed unclean lips. Verse 5 encouraged me, but verse 6 made me shout. In verse 5, Isaiah admitted to the truth regarding things about himself that God had already knew about. But in verse 6, God is still willing to give Isaiah mercy in spite of the dirt that he already has on Isaiah. You, 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 you missed that. You missed that. God still has mercy on each and every last one of us in spite of the dirt that he knows that we're guilty of. I can hear Paul in Romans 5 and 8. God commended his love towards us in that while yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. Jackson Southern Nails used to sing a song, says, he looked beyond all of my faults and saw all of my needs. Yes, Isaiah, he had to undeniably admit to himself that he had downfalls and that he had sin. Thirdly, while studying the text, there is an unfailing alteration. Oh yeah. The only alteration in this world that won't fail is if God orders it so. Come on now, be honest with me. There were some situations in your past that, that really could make you unfit to be who you call yourself. That's me I'm talking about. I, I, I know I still, um, you know, have problems with unclean lips every now and then. And I know in the past these unclean lips um, said some things to people who I thought was trying to hurt me, but they were out to help me. And I know that these unclean lips, God had to deal with them in order to make me worthy to work effectively in his ministry. And so God had to work with Isaiah's faults and alter, alterate his, 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 his body, his mind, and his lips so that he could speak effectively for God. Oh, yes. 
There are some people in Isaiah's past that kept him in the midst of foolishness. God had some alterations in his company in which he kept. Oh yeah, you do understand that verse 6 and verse 7 were just temporal solutions. Temporal alterations that were suitable for Isaiah in order for him to serve in God's service. But that temporal solution actually pointed to a permanent solution. The solution foreshadowed a salvific plan that God himself would do the ultimate alteration in man's soul. Oh well, yeah, verse 6 and verse 7 we see the seraphim picking up a live hot coal that was burning on the altar, placed the burning coal onto Isaiah's lips. And check out what he told him. He said, I've taken away your iniquity or your evil morals and I have also purged or covered your sins but that was just foreshadowing of what God himself would do with a rugged cross and the blood of his perfect son he didn't have to put hot coals on my lips all I had to do was believe that yes, he died. And bright early, Sunday morning, he got up again. And I wasn't purged, I was washed. There's a difference between purging in the text versus washed. The word purge and the text implies to someone covering a roof that has leaks in it. Patch here, a patch there, a patch under here. But the word wash comes from that Greek word puo, which is seen in Revelations chapter 7. When the saints of God, they wash, which means plunge the entire cloth in the blood of Jesus. And as a result, it's made white. Finally, there is an unswaying aberration. You know, Isaiah made up in his mind to surrender to God's ideal. In verse 8, he said, Until the Lord, here am I. Send me, and I'll go. His adoration was unswayed. The divine ideal and the assignment seen in verses 9 and 10 proves his unswaying uh, adoration. Check out what God told him. God told Isaiah, the people will hear you, but they won't understand. Now, if God had told me that, I would have said I quit. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Isaiah, he kept on serving. God told Isaiah, he said, the people will see heavenly hints. But their minds won't be able to understand. 
And the Bible doesn't mention anything about Isaiah turning around. Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. I'll go. I'm about ready to close it, brother. Yes. And you know, I can relate to Isaiah's serenity. Because a long time ago, I heard about a salivific ideal. Yes. I heard how Jesus, the son of the living God, came down yeah, through 42 generations. Y'all gonna help me close this, won't you? 52 burning wells. Got on a nine-month train. And instead of going to the front door of the palace, he went down into a manger. I'm telling you, the idea that I heard the idea that I heard was that Jesus went around raising up the dead. The stories that I heard was that Jesus turned water into wine. The stories that I heard involved Jesus making the dumb to talk and the lame to walk. Didn't he do it? Yes. The stories I heard involved Jesus submitting to his father's idea. And so since he surrendered to his father's idea, I couldn't resist myself. I had to surrender to his idea. He died. Didn't he die? took a rugged cross, put it on his shoulder, marched up to Golgotha's hill, gave up his hands, gave up his feet, gave up his side, and he died. Paul Paul said he died until heaven got the news. He died until the sun put on sackcloth and refused to shine. He died, but bright and early, bright and early, bright and early, Sunday morning, he got up again with all power.